If you think education is expensive, try ignorance. So to know the importance of education and to deliberate on charting the course for maritime education, empowering the future of the industry, I call our next session, sorry, the session partner for this session is JBS Group. And now I request the panel to come forward, which includes Dr. Malini V. Shankar, IS retired officer, Honorable Vice Chancellor at Indian Maritime University. Marine Engineer Atika Rehman Chaudhary, who is Business Development Officer at Bangladesh Marine Academy. And this session is moderated by our very own Gillian Carson Jackson, who is Managing Director at JCG Consulting. Distinguished Honorable Speaker, distinguished guest in person and virtual and attending, uh, all attendants, good afternoon. I am grateful to Maritime CU to facilitate me to be part of this event. Uh, I want to show a PowerPoint presentation for our Bangladesh Marine Academy. It will take only five, five to six minutes. Uh, I think you will enjoy it. Just the Bangladesh Marine Academy developing world-class maritime leaders since 1972. Uh, for starting the marine generation next. Our Bangamundu Sheikh Mojibur Rahman was the father of the nation, founder of the Maritime Bangladesh and founder of the Bangladesh Marine Academy. Our mission is developing the world-class maritime leaders, vision emerging as the leader maritime education and research provider. Inspiration is Allah who has subjected the sea to our. Education program, yearly recruitment, 180 carriers, including two females, but the female numbers are increasing day by day. Pristine nautical carriers, marine engineering and <coughs> nautical science, and Bachelor of Maritime Science honors degree by the university. And uh, we have got recognition from Solent University, Southampton, UK, M UK MCA, MOU with MAP Philippines in process, UK MNTV, World Maritime University, Sweden, IMRS London and Nordic Institute London joint recognition, EUEC Erasmus scholarships, and more recognitions to follow. The British Prime Minister James Callaghan first came to Bangladesh and visited Bangladesh Marine Academy in 1978. And <coughs> IMO Secretary General C.P. Srivastava visited Bangladesh Marine Academy on 3rd June 1980. Even then, IMO Secretary General uh, E.E. Metropolis, he also visited 13th Jan. 2011. Our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina was in the graduation parade in 2011. IMO Secretary General President Juan Kitak Lim also visited our academy. These are the, our prospective employers across the globe. And we have got the full mission breeze simulator. We have got the full mission breeze simulator, engine simulator. We have got the distance learning. Uh, on campus training and due to, uh, during the COVID, it was quite useful. You see, equality and the equity. <clears throat> A smart and skilled maritime leaders for world shipping, economically useful elements for the family, society, and country worldwide. Our female cadets at sea crossing the furious waves and equal worlds is an enabled world. She is the lady. Now he is serving in the Carnival Cruise as a fourth year. She has she have been awarded the President's Gold Medal. It's a milestone for the BMA. <laughs> and you see, this female career, she served in ASP ship management and missions to award goes to her. Last year in Singapore, James Frederick of Singapore Maritime Academy presented this award. So, this is our female cadet. And this 
two female cadets have been recruited by a sponsored by Pacific International Alliance PAL last month. Norwegian High Commissioner visited our academy. And I think we are already at the end of the finish and the Norwegian Institute. Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank. that's all. And it's thank you. Thank you. And that's a really wonderful start to our panel, actually, because we have uh, a really critical topic that we're talking about today. Now, originally the moderator for this session was going to be the one and only amazing Bridget Lee Oden. I'm not her. In case you hadn't recognized. First off, I sound different. Um, but we have actually her notes to help us guide on our way because she had a vision for this session and I want to keep to that vision. This discussion is timely. We saw the Seafarers Happiness Index for quarter two of 2023, and the response to the question, how happy are you about the training you receive, fell. Specific comments related to the practical aspects of training, and really from that point of view, maritime education and training is the core. This discussion is also timely, with the recent International Maritime Simulation Forum, the IMSF, that was held last week at Chalmers. And we saw about the simulator. Thank you so much. And simulation is one of the core areas. Uh, I'm going to take a second here with a side note just to plug my book. Other people can plug their books. I can plug mine. Uh, my, international, my book on the Simulation Instructor's Handbook has been revised and will be relaunched at the Nautical Institute event that's happening in Singapore next week for Simulation Instructors. And please contact me afterwards if you're interested in work the Nautical Institute is doing on effective simulation. There is a questionnaire, a survey being run right now that will also be announced and the initial results will be presented at that forum in Singapore next week. So over the years, the future skill sets of maritime professionals has been a topic of many presentations, many of which has been presented by both of you. And I know that I've participated in discussions with uh, Melanie as well on this very topic. So I'd like to invite the panel to present a bit about themselves. I think you've already done yours. <laughs> Adhikar has already presented, so Melanie, I'd love to invite you to present uh, a little bit about yourself and your passion for this topic, this concept of charting the maritime, using maritime education to chart our course for the future. Good afternoon, everybody, and at the outset, uh, I would like to express my admiration for Sanjum for actually conceptualizing and implementing the Maritime CEO Conference, this is the third edition. And I've been associated with her from the beginning. So I think most of the people here would know about the Indian Maritime University, which was established in 2008, subsuming six pre-existing training institutions. And we cater to 6,000 students who are uh, studying either marine engineering or nautical science, ocean engineering, and uh, logistics related to maritime. So when it comes to the evolution of maritime education and what we need, I think all of us in this room who are involved in the maritime sector are aware that there are two things that you know is pointed out. It's a feedback coming uh, from the industry. One is uh, how futuristic is our education, our curriculum, our syllabus? Are we keeping up with the trends? with the changing technology, which is changing extremely rapidly, and what are we doing about it? So one of the things with, uh, in, um, with respect to this is the involvement of industry is highly essential to shape and to influence the curriculum. As a university, you can't change the curriculum overnight, but I think there are methods by which you review it and reach out to, you know, it's, it's a joint effort. So we did that. We reviewed, revised the uh, syllabus a couple of years ago, two years ago. It's a continuous process. But I think greater the involvement of the industry, greater the benefit for the entire uh, future seafarers. The second thing is um, a university by its nature is about knowledge. But 
Previously, when it was just STCW and there was no degree being awarded, it was more about skills. Can you go on board and can you steer the ship? Can you repair the engines? Can you correct the faults, etc.? Once you move to uh, a degree awarding institution, then it's a lot of theory which is involved. And now the shift is going back to skills. How do you put skills back into that knowledge so that it's just not theory, it's also giving them the adequate skills to go and run the ship backed by the knowledge that they have. And in this respect, the knowledge needs to be highly conceptual and not and analytical, how do you give them the analytical skills? It's not just exam orientation. Our fear in India is our uh, education is so exam oriented that we forget the analytical skills and that's what we are striving to, striving to work for. But here again, I think it's a joint effort by the institution, by the industry. Uh, I mean, we would like industry to come forward and look at case studies, for example, which will give them uh, short of going on board and having on board experience, the case studies are a very, very vibrant way of discussing uh, how to develop the skills. Thank you. And, and I'd just like to pick up on that case studies one because it links back into the simulation that we spoke about. Uh, but I would like to highlight the, the focus that you've, uh, that you've mentioned. It's so important to think about the knowledge and the skills and how they go together the attitude, and as we've heard before, the values, the, the way that we can instill a value, an ethical value for the future. Um, I think that's wonderful. I'd like to explore that question about simulation and this idea of the future vision, case studies and simulation and training. Um, I'm wondering, would, would you like to start that one off? Uh, just to find out a little bit about more about what you envision the role of simulation and case studies working together to provide that future for the uh, seafarer training? Uh, evidently, there's no doubt that you need, um, you know, different methodologies and different ways of trans, um, you know, translating the knowledge to, you know, and um, translating it in such a way that the student is able to absorb the concept, okay, so I think these are not mutually exclusive. Uh, simulators are necessary. The best way is actually to go on board and have training and trading ships, which used to exist, but which became very expensive for most of the nations to, uh, to, to bear the cost. So simulators actually replace the trading and uh, trading ships or the training ships, but the case studies would in my opinion, complement the simulators. Okay, there's always a question, you know, the industry says, when it comes to curriculum, we should not be talking about charts, you should be looking at how to operate the ICDIS. But in fact, both are necessary because without a conceptual knowledge of what the charts are about, an ICDIS would just be like a computer operator, but not somebody who understands what goes behind it. Thank you. Um, and then maybe I could ask Atikar if you could talk a little bit about the technology, because everything is just linking into technology. So the ECTUS that was mentioned, the simulations, as technology is changing, how can we, uh, as educators, what's the industry's role in focusing and to help prepare our seafarers, our future seafarers within this ever-changing technical environment? Thank you, Gillian. It's a very nice question. Actually, education and skill is two things. So, in the maritime industry, what we oversee, skill gap is becoming a industry topic. So, fostering the next generation cadets, we must focus on the skill. Say about, I have done my certificate competency from MCA UK. It's written there. I am competent on this particular job. Why the, nowadays the recent trends, IMO and the regulatory framework body, that those the regulations they are uploading to us, we have to abide by this, all these things. But the automation, digitalization, uh, uh, session, and the um, AI, and the mass, and the autonomous ship, and the decarbonization, and the climate change, uh, all these things are related. Uh, very important is that the, at the moment is the, I mean, decarbonization and parallel with the diversity and inclusion. So, our cadets must be trained with these recent trends of technology. And I'm sure 
two third of the seafarer recently working on board the vessel across the globe there need to be special training to embrace these upcoming rules being adopted to us, i mean uh, by uh, um, to be adopted by us um, uh, i mean uh, given by the uh, imo and the uh, special uh, regulatory framework and the local department of shipping so skill to, to, to be skilled enough to be skilled enough our cadets need to go some special training this special training includes uh, i mean this already being discussed in the imo and we, we, we always follow by IMO 7.03, 7.04 for the cadets. So uh, we cannot pass, uh, bypass the special training. A special training for the special, a special uh, 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 vessels. Say about if I train up a cadet for the chemical tankers, he must undergo the chemical tanker basic safety course and the advanced firefighting. Otherwise, he cannot do job. So we must prepare our uh, next generation cadet with the appropriate training and the as per IMO criteria what they want, what the global maritime industry want, and the skill is needed is very much important. Thank you so much and so well said. And as we're sort of thinking about that, empowering and charting that future for the, uh, the, the route for the future with our seafarers, how can we support this vision? What are some practical elements that we can take from an educational point of view that might actually go beyond what is in the STCW, noting that the changes are happening so fast, if we go back to the technology thoughts, what are maybe one or two practical things that we can do in the maritime education and training environment to actually future-proof our seafarers for an environment that we probably can't even imagine right now because the world is changing so fast? Yes, it's a very nice question. Practical training on board, say about we have got the uh, full mission bridge simulator, we have got the full mission engine simulator. Before I depart from Dhaka, uh, we have installed the high voltage. So actually, uh, I was a cadet, that's a different scenario. Recent cadets, cadets now, 2023 is different. Because uh, there are a lot of technology already arrived. And to embrace this one. If I, I, cannot, I cannot make my cadet overnight chief here. I cannot make, make my cadet overnight master, but what I can do, I can make him prepared for vessel with basic and deep knowledge, which is very much important. So if I take the advantage of simulation as the, uh, say about as a case study, okay, do it and get, uh, give it to me, I'll see, I'll give you the mark. So here is a big role of, I mean, uh, simulation. Simulation will play a vital role for the practical training uh, for our future cadets to be on board accordingly. And SCW matters. SCW is there, and we are hearing this also would be amended. I don't know. Uh, but currently, we follow SCW as well as the IMO rule. Thank you. And uh, Melanie, could you tell us some of the things that you're doing with IMU to future-proof your your students. So, uh, I think, you know, there's a basic three-year or four-year degree course. There's only so much you can give in terms of, as I said, knowledge and skills. And what is necessary and what we are attempting to do is to see how many short-term courses we can give, post-C courses, that they can come back and do at their convenience so that they fast forward their knowledge rather than wait very long time. And I think we need to encourage the seafarers, as my colleague mentioned, to do these courses so that they are, you know, they, they mentally have to be agile and prepared. It's not that I know this, I've done this course, I've got this degree, and I keep sailing for 10 years without uh, constantly renewing my information and knowledge. And, and that constant renewal of information and knowledge is where we're at. It's, it's almost learning to learn continuously because we will never stop learning. And you brought in a very interesting comment about on board ship and ashore. So when I went to sea, it was you went to sea and then you went ashore. Uh, and that's the way the route was. But we're now seeing more moves between, almost a flow between some time on board ship, working ashore, and then the opportunity to go back on board a ship. How could we, from an educational point of view, provide the best environment to support a more flexible approach, perhaps, to seafaring that would support all 
well, diversity. It would support both genders, not just women to come ashore, but men as well. Uh, yes, uh, it's a nice question. Uh, the flexibility. In our academy, we have got four years course, two years at the pre sea cadet, one year at the theoretical I mean, internship on board the vessel. Fourth year, they are coming for the, I mean, uh, Bachelor of Engineering, Marine Engineering, and the Bachelor of Maritime Science under the Bangabundu Sheikh Mohammed Rahman Maritime University. Here is a flexibility. I see few few cadets or few female cadets or male cadets. They want to continue uh, 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 with the, I mean, short job. So, what you mentioned? What are the necessary courses, necessary subject to be prepared for them so that they feel comfort and easily perform their task at home? So I can say the port and logistic, uh, it, it may be a subject. Port management, it must be, uh, uh, can be a subject. Environment science, it can be a subject. It's a very, very hot issue. Because I always, I mean, advise my cadets, okay, sir, in, in which subject I will, sir, uh, do this master's. Okay, go for environment science. Because now the global scenario, what happens in, in two, 2023, in April, the hot, hottest month have been felt. I don't know how many times this will record, uh, I mean, break, uh, the record will be broken. We are in a such an awful position. If we don't mitigate these issues, and uh, we will be in, uh, the world will be in great turmoil, and maybe the world will not be destroyed, but it will be very difficult to stay, survive. So, in my perception, for this flexibility for the shore based carrots, you, we must look into five or six categories, special courses that university can conduct. Thank you. Melanie? So, uh, I will give a very specific uh, response to that. Uh, the Indian Maritime University, we are formulating an MBA program, which is a flexible MBA program specifically intended for COC holders. We're starting with an MBA first for the nautical side, and this we hope to launch as early as February of 2024 which will help them trans you know, uh, transfer to shore jobs. Uh, we'll soon follow that up with uh, a course for COC for the engineering side. The second thing is faculty. You know, they have sailed the seafaring faculty and they've come to teach. We have now tweaked the rules to allow them to take a semester off and actually go back to sailing. This is mutually beneficial for both the faculty because they update their knowledge and immensely beneficial to the student who will be gaining, you know, information and sharing of knowledge, uh, which is very recent and not outdated. So these are some of the initiatives and going forward, we take many more such initiatives. So we are seeing some really great examples of actual practical approaches to how we can chart the, the route for the future for seafarers. Really wonderful to hear. When I w first wanted to come ashore as a navigation officer, it was really hard to consider transferable skill sets. I had a certificate so I could sail on a ship. How could I work ashore? So this is a really wonderful opportunity. And, and I guess it goes back to this supporting the future vision so taking into consideration all of this training that we do, what are some ways that we can help support a future vision for a diverse workforce within the maritime that does have this flow? What are some uh, your thoughts on that aspect? It's not just the, they have to maintain their certificates, they have to go back and keep all their HE, HSEQ requirements. But what is the opportunity for us to promote, to inspire, to pave the way so that we will have a long-term sustainable workforce in the maritime industry? Uh, I think I'll go to Melanie first for this one and then I'll come. Okay, uh, so since we are in a maritime CEO conference, uh, I'm gonna focus on diversity. Uh, I'm very, very happy to share that in 2008, the proportion of women entering the Indian Maritime University for technical courses, the tech and engineering side, was 2%. And this year, we had 9%. I think that's a quantum leap. Um, and if we look at naval architecture, which is an allied field, and we don't talk about it because they don't go sailing necessarily, they don't necessarily get a COC, 27% women. And <laughs> we Amazing. actually ran out of hostel accommodation. 
Um, now, looking at how to encourage women, I think there's a mindset issue among most of the industry. It's just, I mean, we've gone through this. I'm sure, Jillian, you've gone through this. We all entered, uh, whether it's civil service or engineering service, 30 years, 40 years ago. Uh, uh, the mindset is, can we have more women crew managers? Can we have more women seafarers who come to teach? In fact, the latest advertisement of the IMU, I have said, let's just say women are encouraged to apply because they think this is a completely male field. This university will have only males or this field will have only males and they don't even apply. And the result, I think we are getting more women in just by putting this little you know, send a phrase in the advertisement saying women are encouraged to apply because it gives a feeling that the women are wanted. And I think the crew management also should do that because I'm not saying that it is only women who can support women. There are, none of us would have come up just by women's support. We've all had at some point of time the other gender helping us and mentoring us. But it is necessary to have a certain a critical mass of women who can just push the agenda a little bit. The third point I'll make, and it's the last point, is um, women, when they enter this profession, unlike the traditional professions, they come with a certain passion. And I've said this ad nauseum, ad infinitum, that you know they come with a passion, and it, the industry will be the loser if we don't capture that passion and retain them in the industry. Going forward, looking at how automated the ships are becoming, you are not even going to have them, you know, have to lift equipment. This is the, people say, okay, marine engineering, oh, it'll be too hot, you'll have to stand near the engine, all those things. But once it becomes more and more automated, it's going to be electronics-based, sensor-based, and the women will not even have to think about these things. They'll be, they can operate uh, the ships from the shore, for example, so why not if, in, uh, uh, information technology industry today has about 30 to 40 percent women in India. I don't see why shipping cannot reach that percentage. 30 or 40 percent, wow, wouldn't that be amazing? And I get excited when I hear numbers like 16 or 19 or... <laughs> Thank you. Um, some very good ideas. Atikar, what would you like to add to that? Uh, actually, very good discussion in my point of view. We promote female cadets in our academy since 2011, once Honorable Prime Minister instructed. And we are happy to share with you that 85 female cadets have been passed out till now, and 50 female cadets serving on board the vessel across the globe in various kinds of vessels. And our female cadets are serving in passenger ships, our female cadets are serving in the LNG vessels, our female cadets are serving in the oil tanker, VLCC, including all types of vessels. And 15 or 20 female cadets, they don't, they didn't leave the profession. They are in the maritime industry. What Jillian uh, uh, I mean, told that in the crew manager, in the shipping company, uh, even some other uh, cadets are doing their masters in uh, Norwegian uh, Eastern uh, Solent uh, 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 University in Norway. And same thing, they, uh, some, somebody is teacher in the Canadian University. So uh, only fraction of five to six percent they left due to their marriage or so on and so. But at the uh, I mean, Nashal, I am telling, uh, this year we have got 30 female cadets in junior batch. This is really uh, thrice time more than the last year. So our target is 50-50. 50-50, let's see. And uh, one thing, equity, equity and the equality is different thing. So if we want, our, if our target is the equality, the media should be the equity. So I should assist, all should assist the pipeline being created for the female cadets, women at maritime, women at maritime, in, uh, I mean, she, uh, 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 at ship, in ship, we should assist together so that they can climb or they can uh, go up to their apex of their journey. What I mean, a cadet from a captain, a cadet, a chief engineer. Hope so. In our country, we will be able to see a female master and female chief engineer at the end of 2027. Hope for the best, and uh, this uh, is incredible. So diversity, inclusion matters. And diversity is just nothing, but it's not the diversity the female cadets will be in. It's unlocking the whole potential. Unlocking yes, potential, yes, yes, that's so critical. Unlocking the whole potential of the workforces. That's what we need, that's what we need. We work together and I will tell, 
we don't address a female, a female, a woman, a woman. Why not we address a person? That's all. Addressing a person, person. definitely. Yes. I think Melanie yeah, has Jimmy, something she'd like to say. With, with your permission, just two more, uh, you know, for sustainability of inclusiveness. One is I should acknowledge the contribution and the involvement of the industry in India in actually promoting women in seafaring, whether it's because of a policy of uh, inclusion or whether it is coming right from their own policies and principles. So the number of scholarships for women who are pursuing technical courses in the university has increased tremendously. There's several companies which have come forward and that helps, uh, especially because more and more women come from the interiors. They come from small families, you know, not very well off and it has really enabled them to say, confidently say, okay, I have the financial support. And if they do well, the companies are actually absorbing them into the, uh, you know, employment force. The second thing, very, very encouraging, which is very recent now, there's a company which is actually floated in, consult in collaboration with a private uh, maritime institution, a full-fledged course only for women in ratings. That is something. And, and it can happen because um, in India, India has one of the highest proportion of women airline pilots in the world. We have about, you know, it was 19%, it's now about 17 or 16%, it's absolutely the highest in the world. So women will come forward if they have the financial support, the, you know, the mentorship support and a certain guarantee, if they do well, of an employment at the end of it. That's all wonderful. This is such a passionate subject and I think that the concept of thinking of the person and not the gender, normalizing women in these non-traditional roles. We've seen some great examples of the, the work that's already going on in that area. Uh, but time does fly and just, it's really time to bring this session to a close. A couple of the, the key points that have come to me though is the amazing work that's being done by maritime training institutes to really provide and to prepare the seafarers for the future of both genders. And if we can normalize at the cadet level the role of women at, in, in all positions as engineers, as ratings, as navigation officers, then that will take forward that vision for the future of the next generation. Thank you very much.